Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our lecture series on modern conflict and emerging threats. My name is Nilu Razi Howe, and I'm a distinguished visiting professor at Vanderbilt focused on the future of modern conflict and emerging threats. Together with my colleague, General Tuna Moore, I've been working closely with Chancellor Deermeyer, Provost Sibel Raber, and our incredible, incredible faculty on developing Vanderbilt's offerings in this area, including helping organize Vanderbilt's annual summit on modern conflict and emerging threats, which is happening this year on April 17th and 18th. In addition to my work at Vanderbilt, I serve on a few government advisory boards, including at the, at the US Department of Defense, um, as well as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at, at the Department of Homeland Security. I also invest in security technology companies and serve on a number of public and private corporate boards. Today, in our third installment of this lecture series, I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker, Ambassador Nathaniel Fick, the inaugural U.S. Ambassador at Large for Cyberspace and Digital Policy at the State Department. Having Ambassador Fick in this role is an important step in addressing the critical challenges that we face in cyberspace. We are at an inflection point in society as enormous technological and societal shifts are converging to reshape the geopolitical and national security landscape, as well as the underpinnings of our democracy. The world is changing at a speed, scope, and scale of nothing we've ever experienced. New, highly advanced technology is being adopted at a blinding pace as we digitize business, economic, defense, and social infrastructures. We are embracing AI, cloud computing, autonomous vehicles, small low earth orbit satellites with advanced sensor platforms, drones, distributed ledger technology, augmented and virtual re reality. On the horizon, we see the emergence of advanced wireless, wireless uh, networks, microsensor proliferation, autonomous weapons, quantum computing, synthetic biology, and artificial general intelligence, just to name a few. It's an exciting time, and there are consequences. Over time, almost everything we've experienced in the physical world, prosperity, democracy, crime, corruption, warfare, will happen digitally, but with a speed and severity that we are just beginning to comprehend. This isn't about technology alone or something that takes place in the dark corner of the internet. It's happening every moment in our offices, in our embassies, our military bases, our cars, our family rooms, and in our children's pockets. And it will redefine the geopolitical landscape. As the US government organized to face the challenge of our digital era and brought its tools of national power to bear on its consequences, for too long it ignored one of the most important tools we have, diplomacy. Our diplomatic core was neither experienced in nor appreciated how technology was reshaping the geopolitical landscape. That all changed when on September 21st, 2022, Ambassador Fick was sworn in as the ambassador overseeing the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy and the Office of the Special Envoy for Critical and Emerging Technology. The State Department established these organizations as part of a comprehensive effort to modernize American diplomacy and make technology central to US foreign policy. As Ambassador Fick noted in congressional testimony, his organization has a clear mission, to shape the terms of the technology future and to extend the administration's modern industrial and innovation strategy into the international realm. Under his leadership, the Bureau has doubled in size, established a department-wide award for excellence in tech diplomacy, and launched a fully integrated training initiative with the goal of having a trained cyber and digital officer at every mission dealing with these issues by the end of this year, which is an appropriately ambitious goal that's actually being met, having already trained over 100 officers, with another 35 being trained just this week. Looking forward, Congress has authorized the creation of a dedicated cyber, digital, and related technology fund to enable the department's ability to provide critical and agile assistance to foreign partners. How has so much been accomplished in such a short period of time? Usually comes down to leadership. With a broad set of experiences and accomplishments, Ambassador Fick is uniquely situated for this role. Prior to joining the State Department, 
Ambassador Fick was a technology executive and entrepreneur. He was CEO of Endgame, a venture-backed cybersecurity company through its acquisition by Elastic. Prior to Endgame, he was CEO, CEO of the Center for New American Security, a national security research organization. Earlier in his career, Ambassador Fick served as a Marine Corps infantry and reconnaissance of, officer with combat tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. Ambassador Fick graduated with high honors and classics from Dartmouth College, where he wrote his senior thesis on Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War and its implications for American <laughs> foreign policy. It is remarkable, actually, how much we can still learn about power relations today from someone who wrote over two millennia ago. Ambassador Fick, being an underachiever, also holds an MPA from Harvard Kennedy School and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Having straddled both public service and private sector entrepreneurship and innovation, he brings a much needed perspective to the State Department and is perfectly positioned to ensure that our diplom diplomatic efforts with respect to technology are effective. Speaking with Ambassador Fick this afternoon is Chancellor uh, Daniel Deermeyer, an in internationally re renowned political scientist and management scholar. Daniel Deermeyer is the ninth chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Since joining Vanderbilt, Chancellor Deermeyer has led an ambitious program of growth and advancement. Under his visionary leadership, the university has risen in stature, successfully launched a record $3.2 billion fundraising campaign, and topped the $1 billion mark in research funding for the first time in the university's history, and reaffirmed its longstanding commitment to free expression and civil discourse. He has driven efforts to become the destination for leading faculty and the most promising students to create a culture of radical collaboration and personal growth for Va Vanderbilt's faculty, students, and staff, and to expand Vanderbilt's global presence. Before arriving at Vanderbilt, Chancellor Deermeyer served in leadership and faculty role roles at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, and at University of Chicago, where he served as a dean of the Harris School of Public Policy and subsequently as provost. Please help me in welcoming Ambassador Fick and Chancellor Deermeyer to the stage. Well, Ambassador Fick has it all figured out already, so all we have to do is, is now hear the solutions, right? That's the plan for this afternoon. Um, well, first of all, Ambassador, welcome to Vanderbilt University. It's an honor to have you with us, and we're really looking forward to the conversation. Let's start with um, one aspect that, uh, that was already um, um, highlighted and touched upon in Nilo's uh, thoughtful and insightful um, introduction to today's panel, or today's conversation, which is, when, I think when we typically think about conflict or cyber, we're thinking maybe NSA or Cyber Command, but we're not thinking diplomacy. And so um, how, give us a sense of how diplomacy plays into the broad sense of kind of cyber security, cyber conflict. We heard a little bit about the modernization of the State Department, but it is, it is such a fascinating um, dimension, I think, that I'd love to hear how these things fit together. Chancellor, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here in Nashville at Vanderbilt with all of you. Nilu, thank you for the introduction. Nilu and I were business partners for a couple of years, so she does, in fact, know too much. Uh, there are very few people who have the same combination of public and private sector experience that she does, so you're fortunate to have her uh, on the faculty here. Uh, this question about diplomacy, Chancellor, is uh, actually at the heart of why uh, I wanted to come back into public service and do it at the State Department. And I had the privilege of sitting down with students for uh, a little while earlier and said that in my mind, our national security establishment is like one of those crabs on the beach that has one really big claw and one really little claw. And uh, diplomacy is the little claw hmm. uh, in our system, in budgetary terms, in personnel terms. Mm -hmm. There are more US Army captains than there are foreign service officers. So one rank in one service, <laughs> and they outnumber every member of the US Foreign Service. That's kind of an extraordinary thing. So we've underinvested in the diplomatic side of things. And to your question, what, what does it mean? 
uh, the norms, the principles undergirding our international approach to cybersecurity get decided in multilateral fora. They get codified in treaties. They get negotiated. Our bilateral and multilateral relationships all around the world increasingly have a technology element to them. And uh, a famous Silicon Valley entrepreneur and investor, Mark Andreessen, in the 1990s said, software is eating the world. Yes. And I think the analog is tech is eating foreign policy. Yes. Fascinating. So um, tech, is, tech is eating foreign policy. Now, that is a provocative statement. Go a little deeper. Intentionally well, so. Yes, I know. Go to, uh, help us to understand a little bit better. So I, I'm, again, hard-pressed to think about a single bilateral relationship, a relationship between the United States and another country, or a single multilateral gathering, NATO, the EU, uh, or a single functional area from climate to arms control that isn't increasingly depended upon or defined by tech. Mm -hmm. um, I'd go a little bit further and say that technology innovation as a source of national power is increasingly foundational. Our traditional measures of strength that we're accustomed to talking about, like GDP or military capacity, are more and more downstream of a nation or a coalition's ability to innovate in these key technology areas. Let's go and think a little bit more about what has changed. Um, no, you no no. You know, I love I love the Thucydides, you know, kind of um, thesis. That's that's perfect. <laughs> I was so hoping when she was talking about Dartmouth and classics that we were landing with the Peloponnesian War, and we did. <laughs> perfect. So, um, and I'll come back to that later. But we we were talking about it a little bit earlier in like when we had a, a couple of minutes before the panel. But I think one thing that's always fascinating, at least um, when you think about the last. 60, 70, 80, and 80 years, is that when we have, we have uh, new technologies that change the nature of warfare and nature of conflict, it usually, it's usually accompanied with a different way of thinking about conflict. And even different disciplines, uh, academic disciplines that become important. So um, I think you know, when we think about the Cold War and the nuclear age, that was uh, the birthplace of modern game theory, right? I mean, that's when we had like concepts like mutual assured destruction and flexible response and Hermann Kahn and John von Neumann and a lot of the chicken game, you know, Thomas Schelling. I mean, all these concepts came out by, by a thought, I think by the desire to understand the logic of, um, of deterrence and how to think about it. And then, you go a little bit further and you think about uh, the post-9-11 conflicts. Very different, sub-state, um, uh, often a combination of um, political and economic development and security. Um, much more, not grand theory, but like empirical analysis to figure out what works where, I think. Very different. And now, of course, we have a cyber conflict or cyber security the whole like, question of technology, technological infrastructure, offensive, defensive capabilities, and so forth. Um, my, I'm going to say, you said something provocative. I'm going to say something provocative. It, maybe it's provocative, maybe not. Have we figured this out yet? <laughs> uh, no, we haven't. And I think therein lies the opportunity. So I, I agree we're in the beginning of a new phase here. Um, the post-Cold War, War framework has definitively changed. Um, the post-9-11 framework has definitively changed. We are, I, I think we're getting back to a world where great power competition is back above the waterline. Yes. Maybe it was always there. Yes. But it was below the water. Took a, took a break for a while, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah it was yeah, there. Yeah, we just yeah, didn't yeah, talk yeah, about it. We didn't yeah. see it. Uh, but now it's back, definitively yeah. back. Yeah. And I think technology competition is one of the defining battlegrounds of that great power competition. Uh, and so we see it playing out in competition between the United States and China. Yeah. Uh, we see it playing out in the asymmetric advantages that technology affords Ukraine on the battlefield against Russia. Yeah. We see it playing out 
in almost literally every country in the world where there is a competition underway between the United States and its allies and China, which doesn't really have allies, but a couple of transactional partners who are trying to get infrastructure and technology infrastructure deployed, and these are generational investments. So that becomes the underpinning of economies, of information sharing relationships that are gonna endure for decades. Um, if we think about, you know, kind of maybe, I mean, there was, I, I, I stopped counting at some point when Lilo gave the whole list of technologies there, which is like an incredible list. So I'm just gonna focus on generative AI just for a moment. Um, I think if, if I go back or try to go back like uh, four or five years ago, I think there was a strong sense that um, there was a real competition between China and the United <coughs> and the United States on AI. And now that's not all of AI, of course, but it's like the, the headline grabbing, you know, large language models and, and generative um, AI. Everything, all the big companies are like U.S. based. I mean, I think if, if the first one, we have this, this French company, Mistral, I think, landed like a big investment, but totally dominated. The whole industry totally dominated by, by the United States. Um, um, uh, have, we, have we overestimated the capabilities of China in this case, or of others, or are there belief are there beneath the surface, or is this a... Is this, a, is it this kind of an optimism that has to be, has to be taken with a big grain of salt? So I want to come back to that point of U.S. dominance in these technologies right now because I think it's a really important one. Uh, on on China, and generative AI, uh, there are fairly well known inputs to uh, generating capability in this area: hardware, software, talent, data. Um, I think it is dangerous for us to assume that one can sustain a hardware or software advantage for long. Yeah. Uh, I think that export controls and, and uh, the sort of regimes aimed at handicapping an opponent or slowing an opponent down, a competitor down, are necessarily transitory and imperfect. They don't last for long. Yeah. Uh, the talent, the global talent war matters a lot. It's, in my view, absolutely essential that the United States remain the destination of choice for smart people all around the world who want to uh, build a business, build a life, uh, create something new. Uh, that's ultimately uh, what guarantees our long-term competitive success, in my view. Uh, and I think the data flow issue, uh, Chinese restrictions on data flow are starting to come back and haunt them a little yes. bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, it'll be interesting to see how she moves on that or doesn't move on that, given his kind of overwhelming security focus otherwise. And the crackdown on tech, and, you know, at the, at the most inopportune time in some sense. And, well, for in, inopportune for them. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and talent's mobile, so <laughs> that's great. I'll take it. Let's open the doors. Um, but but, but the, the, the point um, that you made about the fact that all of these companies are American companies is something that we should come back to for a second, because uh, it's true. And we know why. Uh, we have a pretty good sense. I'm sure there are academics here who have a very good sense, a methodologically rigorous and empirical sense of what makes these innovation ecosystems possible. The rule of law, bankruptcy, bankruptcy provisions, education from early childhood to, to post-graduate, uh, venture, cap venture capital, uh, risk capital, uh, big technology companies, you know, we, we sort of know what the components are. And for a bunch of reasons, the cloud computing hyperscale businesses of the last 15 years are all American companies. As we look ahead though, to the AI era, I think it would, and this is a point I make to my European colleagues all the time, if the top 10 global AI businesses are all American companies, not only will Europe have missed the boat, and yes. Japan missed the boat, and South Korea missed the boat, and Australia missed the boat, but we will have missed the boat too. Because ultimately, um, the idea of digital sovereignty on any of these things, the idea that you can go it alone, I don't care who you are, how big you are, how powerful you are, I think it's a mirage. Uh, I would replace it with a framework 
like digital solidarity mm -hmm. and say, you know, it's the, like those broadsides from the American Revolution. We either hang together or we surely hang separately. Uh, this is one of those topics where we better hang together with our allies and partners or we will get picked apart one by one. I'll just make a little footnote on that. Um, one thing that uh, is astonishing, at least to me, is like, the, I think that, you know, the business case for these technologies really hasn't quite be, be quite made yet for generative AI. I think that's like exciting and yeah, you can write a poem that kind of looks okay and you know, you don't, you know, that, okay, well, that's cool, you know, and, uh, and then yet now you can do videos that almost look like, yeah, good, okay. Uh, not as good as Excel, you know, I would say at this point, uh, not, not, not exactly a killer app, but uh, we know this, we see this now in the university how it's totally transformative and transforming science in, in everything, everything that we see. And uh, astonishingly, um, in, in disciplines ranging from, you know, looking at protein structures all the way down to the humanities. Because for the first time now, you can analyze text and, and images in a, in a rigorous way, and that opens up all sorts of possibilities. So we see it, we, I think that the, the, we're, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg of the transformation of that when we look at science, and there's going to be enormous, enormous potential and enormous things that are going to be unleashed literally, literally as we speak. So hanging, what was that, hanging together or something? Hanging separately or surviving together yeah, or hang, something? Hang together, stick together, stick or get together hung or separately. Stick together or hung separately. Okay, good. Well, that's a cheerful motto for the rest of the conversation. Um, that's the world that's I live the in right world, now. That's me. the world. So... Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, cyber conflict and the challenges that um, I think that it, that it generates for us. So here's just one, one example. Um, I mean, the key, a key component, I think, of, of um, Cold War doctrine and strategy and you know, whether it's mutual assured destruction or a flexible response was, when, you know, when, that, when that rocket was flying, you knew where it came from. And that allows you, of course, to make your own strategies contingent on who the aggressor was. Now we don't have that. We don't have that um, luxury anymore. Um, it's it's um, w where attacks come from can be concealed. It's not clear. Um, how do we think about that? And how do we think about you know re responding to these types of things? If 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 there's always a, a, a you know a shadow of a doubt, and how does diplomacy play into that? So I certainly agree that it's not as clear cut as having a satellite picture of a missile launch. Plan. Yeah. Uh, General Moore's colleagues have, former colleagues, have done a very good job of uh, helping us get better at uh, attribution. I, I would say that attribution of cyber attacks has maybe evolved from being primarily a technical challenge to being primarily a political challenge. Mm. Um, so, and, and, and diplomacy plays a very important role here. So when the Russians, um, just before the invasion of, further invasion of Ukraine in February of 22, they, they launched a crippling attack on the European satellite provider Vi, uh, Viasat. And uh, it was pretty clear empirically, methodologically, forensically, that that attack was a Russian attack relatively quickly. Um, but it took months to do the public attribution because of the diplomatic effort involved in getting uh, more than 30 NATO and EU member states on board willing to stand together and publicly attribute that attack to Russia. Multilateralizing that attribution, though, made it much more effective. Uh, it sent a much stronger signal. This is the simple reality that it's easy to pick on one kid on the playground, but it's hard to pick on 30 kids. And, and that's true, obviously, in international affairs as well. So a lot of the diplomacy uh, has to be undergirded by, the, by, by technology and by technical uh, topics, but it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of wrangling and horse trading with people to get them to do things that are uncomfortable. And how do we think about time here, the time it takes? So you have, in this particular case, you know, even attack on the satellite system and Diplomacy kicks in, and we're not, but you know, it takes a lot of time to get people coordinated at that point. Isn't, isn't there any way for us to kind of like 
be ready for this and be quicker? S terrific question. So we, we were asking the same question <laughs> after that. Um, and, and actually, uh, within NATO, decided to set something up uh, called the Virtual Cyber Incident Support Capability. Mm. Terrible acronym. Mm. Um, but what it is, is a menu of options, uh, government options and private sector options, that every NATO member state can contribute to its allies in the event of a cyber attack. Uh, that's one element of it. The other element is literally a list of phone numbers. Oh, that's useful. It, uh, yeah. Shockingly yeah. useful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. kind of scary how simple yeah. stuff like this matters, yeah. but the, the, the bad attack is always gonna happen on the Friday night of a holiday weekend when everybody's gone. Yeah. And so knowing how to reach people quickly and having a, a, a pre-cooked list of what's available mm. uh, is actually a dramatic accelerant. So little things like that that, that don't feel like you know, grand strategic, they're very operational, they're very <laughs> concrete, they're very tangible, they're very simple. Um, but cumulatively, I think they speed up our responsibility. So, Let's talk about Russia a little bit, uh, and uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, you mentioned the um, you know tremendous capabilities that Ukraine has been able to deploy, um, you know, with support, of course. Um, if we go back to the to the attack, I think um, I think there was a sense in like in the general public is that um, Russia could have done a lot more. Well, there was a concern. I remember this well, actually. I think where I went was in one conversation with one with one general, and the sense was, in that conflict, you're going to see for the very first time how one power can knock out the entire technology capability of an opponent like that. We didn't see that. Uh, we saw some things, but we didn't see. Um, I mean. Ukraine was not crippled technologically. Did we overestimate the Russian capabilities? Did we prepare or did Ukraine prepare appropriately? How should we think about that? Given that the conflict is still raging, I think we should approach answering that with a fair degree of humility yes. and recognize that we're very much in the midst of this. Exactly. Um, but I would offer a few uh, reasons for, for why perhaps things have unfolded the way they have. One, uh, the Russians perhaps have been um, as capable in the cyber domain as they've proven to be in the kinetic domain, which is not very. <laughs> um, old equipment, uh, poorly maintained, uh, doctrinally stupid, um, almost utterly lacking uh, a professional NCO core, um, just one thing after another. Uh, right down the line has has hampered their ability to perform on the battlefield. Um, you know, landmines and artillery barrages and World War One tactics are uh, are kind of what we've seen. Um, so perhaps that structural ineptitude has extended into the cyber domain. Perhaps um, Ukrainian defenses have been pretty good. Uh, I, I think there have actually been quite significant and in some cases sophisticated Russian cyber attacks inside Ukraine, uh, but they've, they've been stopped because of collaboration among the Ukrainian government, uh, other governments, technology companies with a lot of infrastructure deployed in Ukraine. Uh, back to the humility point, I think we have to uh, keep top of mind that they may well have other capabilities up their sleeves that they haven't used yet, they haven't escalated to yet that they view as part of an escalatory ladder and they're waiting. Um, so that has to be present in our minds. And then outside Ukraine, uh, I, th I think it's, uh, it's pretty hard to argue that, that uh, NATO deterrence hasn't worked. I mean, I, I think NATO deterrence is working pretty well. I was most recently in Ukraine just two weeks ago, and I'll tell you, you cross the border uh, from Ukraine into Poland and you feel like you're sheltering under the warm embrace of Article <laughs> 5 again. I mean, it is like a... It's a collective. You're entering it's Article a, 5. Yeah, it's <laughs> like a on real, the border. It's a real <laughs> exhalation, and it feels awfully good over a space of about 100 yards. <laughs> uh, okay, let's talk about um, China. And you mentioned it already. Um, um, 
we talked a little bit about like the the development and uh, and you know of AI and, and other capabilities, but there's I think there's something particularly interesting about um, technology or technological conflict. Um, so we're like, uh, where's my, where's where's my? There's Brett. Brett. Brett is our CFO, but he also oversees IT, including everything uh, uh, cybersecurity. And we're getting like how much like attacks every every day? Tens of thousands. So we're getting we're getting tens of thousands. Um, um, It'll be more after this conversation. I'm sorry. More after this conversation. <laughs> uh, that's probably true. So at any rate, we're getting. So we have this interesting. Um, so while we're doing, while we are, you know, we have com lots of commercial relationships with China. Um, we are like, a, well, there's still quite a bit of trade going on. People have direct investments. Um, we're with TikTok. I mean, there is like a, there's a there's a kind of norm, normalcy. And then at the same time, you get ten thousand attacks a day. Okay, yeah. and uh, what is that? I mean, is that conflict or how, how should we even think about that? You know, it's like a, is that is it, on the one hand, you know, we're we're like a, we're having joint ventures. On the other hand, we're defending. That those very joint ventures from cyber attacks um, every day. So is that like collaborative and conflict at the same time? I, I think it's part of the answer to maybe the question that uh, that we opened with about what the elements of this new paradigm are. Yes, this new era. And um, I, th I think you you draw an important distinction, which is R Russia really is a pariah on the international stage right now. Yes, uh, Russia is violating the the norms of the rules-based international order that have pertained since 1945. Yeah. Um, Ch China is something quite different. Our, our, our goal with Russia, my boss, Secretary Blinken's stated objective is to ensure that Russia's further invasion of Ukraine results in a strategic defeat for Russia. Yeah. Thinking about China is very different. Our strategy with China is invest, align, compete. It's, it is uh, wildly different. And the relationship is much more multifaceted and complex and has many positive qualities and positive dimensions. And there are lots of things in the world that only go well if we collaborate and work together, from climate to agricultural productivity to medical diagnostics. There's a long list. Um, and there is all this activity <laughs> that's really troubling that's yeah, happening yeah. just yeah. below the threshold of the use of force. And Many of uh, my colleagues in the U.S. government um, testified about this just a couple of weeks ago while I was in Ukraine um, in, in open testimony about, about uh, China holding U.S. critical infrastructure at risk uh, and deploying capabilities across vast swaths of U.S. infrastructure that could be activated at some point in the future, yeah. uh, coupled with uh, what we already know is a concerted effort by the PRC to build a social graph of essentially all Americans hoovering up data wherever they can. Uh, there's a White House executive order that came out just today um, to, to f begin finally to put some checks in place on that. Um, listen, I, I, I think it's, a, it, it's hard to understand. It requires some intellectual spade work, and, and maybe some of that can get done here. I will be an avid consumer of it. Where are you on the China decoupling debate? My view is that, uh, well, uh, I'll give you an anecdote. Um, my last act as a private citizen before taking this job was to uh, co-chair a Council on Foreign Relations Task Force report on cybersecurity. Uh, Nilu was a member of that task force. And the first line of our report is, the era of the global internet is over. Mm. It's not the mm. kind of definitive statement you want to make right before rolling into a Senate confirmation process. Mm. Uh, That's a juicy line. But I, uh, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, but but I think it's true. Um, it's not the future we want, but it's the future we seem to have. I think you can extend that into other areas, and uh, we are emerging again from. If we're talking about eras and frameworks, we're emerging from a period of time where, for thirty years or more global supply chains were built and optimized according to basically one variable, and that was cost. Um, and now, uh, the resurgence of great power competition and a global pandemic 
have made pretty clear to everybody that, well, actually, you know what, we probably should be building and optimizing global supply chains for quality and resilience and security mm -hmm. in addition to cost. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I think decoupling would be um, unfortunate. I think decoupling is avoidable. Um, I think decoupling is not the objective, but certainly some de-risking is. Mm -hmm. So um, when we think about the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and it had, I think has many interesting dimensions, but one of the most interesting to me is it was kind of a high point of diplomacy, so to the sanctions, right? So rather than, um, I mean, un, 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 unprecedented sanctions, I would say, you know, with SWIFT, for example, which was... Um, I, I, still read the, I'm, I still read the German papers from time to time. I remember like how the German government basically flipped over, over the weekend. You know, first like, oh my God, no, we can't do that. And then on Monday, hmm, yeah, okay, like we're helping. So um, I'm sure you did that too. Uh, so at any rate, um, um, but tremendous emphasis on sanctions, um, all the way down to sanctions towards, you know, the oligarchs that are supporters of the regime. Um, your assessment of, of when we look at that, it seems like it hasn't really done its job. Um, or maybe has it. Maybe it, it prevented something much worse. Where, 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 where are you on that? I think that there <laughs> are uh, obviously no silver bullets. Um, that's point one. Point two is it's awfully hard to prove a negative. Yes, exactly. So um, hard, hard to tease out what the counterfactual would have been absent the sanctions. So I think they're an important element. Uh, I don't think they're determinative. Um, but they, uh, they, they do have a cumulative effect over time. They do have, uh, they deny things to the Russians that would make their war effort easier. Um, and they're a tool in the toolbox, and they have to be used in concert with many other tools. Um, the basic uh, strategy, in my view, over the last two years has been a, a bit of a the frog in boiling water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the United States and NATO uh, are doing things on a regular basis now that would have been considered wildly escalatory in February of 2022. And uh, so initially, it was important to lead with what was politically feasible at the time and what was unlikely to provoke a Russian military response at the time. And that set of actions included sanctions. There was also an interesting thing that um, the private sector was kind of participating broadly. I mean, McDonald's um, basically gave up its assets um, in Russia. Many companies pulled out. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a, sometimes it was a little it went a little too far. I remember like a, the the symphony orchestra in Cardiff was no longer performing pieces by Russian composers, which seemed seemed a little over the top to me. But um, but there was this there was this interesting um, collaboration, I would say, or coalition that went that went beyond just sanctions, but it had. Um, it had the private sector, maybe because of, of social pressure or because of, um, um, I think, but because of idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic reasons, but a broader sense that you just, it's just a moral thing to do. How much coordination was there? Or was this like people were just kind of like everybody, everybody was trying to do the right thing at the, right, at the same time? On the, on the private sector? Yes. Side? Uh, I, I, I don't think there was a ton of, um, certainly not a lot of State Department coordination. Uh, I know there was a Yale professor who was doing yes, this yes, from yes. a public, yeah, kind Jeffrey of a public Sonnenfeld. shaming, yeah, yeah, yeah. shaming yeah. standpoint. He seemed yes. to be pretty effective. Um, also, look, I mean, let's, let's say the other uncomfortable thing, which is uh, the Russian market's not that big. It wasn't that important for a lot, of, a lot of companies in many industries, and walking away from it wasn't that hard. Yeah. Um, Chinese market is quite different. Yes, and, exactly. And um, um, did you, if if there is a, this may be too speculative, but I'll try it anyway. If there is a if there is a conflict over Taiwan, 
let's say, do we expect the same kind of use of sanctions? <coughs> to, to, you can say it's too speculative. Uh, yeah, it's speculative, but, but I mean, we have to certainly, um, mm -hmm. we need to think about a wide range of scenarios without kind of favoring or handicapping one above the other. Um, I, I think I, I would, I would, I was a Marine early in my career. Uh, we were all forced to read Sun Tzu. Yes. And, and Clausewitz, I hope. Of course. Okay, very good. No, now, I feel, now I feel better. Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu is, is the slim, slim and simple. Clausewitz is thick yeah, and well. dense, uh, but both important. Um, but, but a fundamental proposition in Sun Tzu is the best way to win is not to fight. Yes. So I operate, certainly in the technology realm, on the assumption that the Chinese objective is not to fight. Mm -hmm. There are there are better ways. Because they read it too. There are smarter ways. Yes, they they, they read, read it too, it. yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm just a reader from the outside. It's in their <laughs> cultural heritage yes, and yes. intellectual heritage. And yes. so I, I, I think that uh, uh, all of these issues that you're talking about where the, the interesting activity is happening below the threshold of the use of force, yes. the most decisive things over time are accruing and accreting in that gray zone, that's the mental model uh, that I think is probably likely to be most useful in that scenario, but I'll also caveat that and say, I threw my crystal ball away a long time ago because it doesn't work. So we need to be prepared for a full range of possibilities. As we're thinking about these possibilities, I think one thing that makes this type of conflict, cyber conflict technology, um, we talked about um, supply chains already, particularly tricky is that a lot of the core assets are held by private entities. I mean, and you know, Elon Musk is kind of like just one example of that. But if you think about critical infrastructure in a whole variety of different er areas, um, whether it's uh, phone systems, whether it's like com so communication systems, energy, we had that before. And uh, you know, we had uh, something similar post 9/11 when we were worried about terrorist attacks and. Um, the other question was, you know, how do we harden power plants and dams and stuff like that? And um, but this is much, much, much harder. I think much more challenging. And I think again, particularly a role for diplomacy. Maybe it's not diplomacy, but how do we, in a traditional way, but in a way that you just, I think, outlined it in a kind of more, more expansive way. How do we make sure that this is that this is coordinated? So I, I certainly agree with the statement that the majority of the critical infrastructure and the attack surface that we care about protecting sits in the private sector. Um, the diplomatic angle there, I think, is that uh, th despite our shortcomings, despite our structural dysfunction, despite our disagreements, uh, the United States still manages to be pretty good uh, in relative terms on a lot of these issues with regard to our strategy, our doctrine, our technological preparedness, our incident response planning, all this stuff uh, that, that we do pretty well and that many of our allies and partners are eager to uh, replicate or learn from. And so uh, one of the things that, that I and, and my team do is take what we're doing in our power industry or water or the electricity grid and then try to internationalize it yes. so that our allies and our partners are more resilient. Um, I think there's also a, a, a broader conversation that's beginning to happen around uh, you know, just because we can digitize something or connect something, should we? So. And I, I just, I want my refrigerator to keep my food cold. I don't need it being used to launch a DDoS attack against my neighbors, right? So, um, uh. so, <laughs> <laughs> uh. most of the time, yeah. most of the time. Yeah. yeah. So uh. it's, it's, I, th I think this is maybe a broader philosophical question, but, but one of the elements of this new era that we're entering is, is, um, Certain things will continue to digitize at a rapid rate and competitiveness will depend upon it, yeah. but maybe not everything will. Yeah. And, and we may see some 
some intentional. We go back uh, to analog, so to speak. In some in some yeah. areas, perhaps, yeah, deliberately or redundantly yeah. for resilience. Uh, for, 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 that's from, from, so, when we think about allies, um, you mentioned it right at the beginning, and 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 we're just talking about it again. Um, as we're thinking about these types these types of conflict, um, this is like an overstatement, but uh, maybe not too much. I think during the during the Cold War, if you were a European country, and um, you could basically say, okay, well, there's the you know nuclear umbrella. It's called Article Five. It's the Article Five effect, right? So you kind of you go in. There's there's the promise. You know, you got your you got your um, you, you know you you got your your facilities. You got you're ready, but it's fundamentally guaranteed by the United States. Um, you know, with with allies, okay, fine, but that's what does it. That's the that's the thing. And now, um, if 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 they're not part of this in a in a serious way, um, in part because of internationalized infrastructure, and because so many of these things are interconnected, digitized, can, can, can't have any slackers. Right, you just had that. that that's a, that's 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 a, that's a totally different thing now. I think in the you know in, in it, it, it was possible to be a little free riding. In you know in the nuclear age, but not anymore. Is that is that an overstatement? No, I don't think it's an overstatement at all. I think I think it's again one of the one of the defining elements of this new reality. Uh, risk federates across all these digital relationships, and so it really is a a weakest link kind of mm. problem, where. Um, just to use one example, uh, information and intelligence sharing across even a very close set of relationships like the NATO alliance requires some degree of trusted infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, and we do not have uniformly high uh, digital, uniformly secure digital architectures and uniformly high security standards even across the NATO alliance. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does become a, it becomes a challenge. And, and, and add to that, I think, you know, the fact that there, there is this like technological dominance of the United States, at least in many technologies. Um, how do we, how do we get there? So uh, there are some important, at least one important exception to technological dominance by the United States. And I think it is illustrative of a, of a broader point, And that's telecom tech. Yes. So... In the 1990s, if we were sitting here in February of 1994, 30 years ago, uh, the global leaders in telecom included French companies, Finnish, Swedish, Japanese, Korean, and American, yeah. several American companies. Uh, most of those companies are now gone. The ones that remain are shadows of their former selves. And I, I joke sometimes, I'm, I'm Ericsson and Nokia's unpaid sales guy. I'm. <laughs> I go around the world doing deals for Finnish and Swedish telecom companies <laughs> because they are, in our view, trusted technologies. They, they are uh, real companies in democratic societies where the companies are not obligated to turn over all the user data to the government uh, without any oversight mechanism at all. And they're competing with Huawei or ZTE, Chinese companies, which are actually beholden by law to do the bidding of the Chinese government in opaque ways at any time. Yeah. And so uh, this is an area where uh, the US isn't dominant. So much of what we do diplomatically is often misinterpreted as pushing the narrow commercial interests of US companies. Of course, advocating for US companies is, important, is an important job for the US government. But going back to this notion of digital solidarity mm -hmm. and, and the need to hang together, the US doesn't have a full stack telecom provider anymore. Ours all got killed. Uh, by a combination, I'd say, of government inattention, some corporate complacency, IP theft by the Chinese, subsidies by the PRC government to Huawei, but they're gone. Uh, but we still have a couple of pretty strong and, and certainly trustworthy European companies, and it's a good example of where we can uh, demonstrate the good faith of our intentions here. Excellent. So I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, and I want—I'd love to hear a little bit. Of, this is like a startup you're doing in some sense, 
in the State Department, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, it's a bit of an overstatement, but not much. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you bring, how do you, I mean, that's the classic questions. How do you get talent? How are they, you know, how are they trained? Um, we heard the exact numbers that were trained today, 35 I heard, this week. Okay, good. So, so when you when you started with that, I mean, what was what was your framework for that? Because it, 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 it does feel like a startup inside the State Department. Yeah, it is. It, it certainly is, and it's actually one of the things that attracted me to it was uh, you don't get a lot of opportunities to start new things in in the government, especially a new thing at a time that feels really consequential in in sort of the definitional period of a new era where these technology issues are going to be really central. So. In addition to ensuring a strong foreign policy out in the world, one of our top priorities from day one was building institutional capacity at the State Department mm. in order to ensure that we can continue to do this work for the long haul. And uh, that involved, in my mind, a few things. Uh, it meant, of course, getting the organizational structure and sort of the substantive agenda right at the beginning, but really importantly, because the State Department operates in 190 countries around the world. Uh, we needed to get the expertise out to the edge where the real work gets done. The real work of the State Department doesn't get done at headquarters. Mm -hmm. The real work of the State Department, like the real work of the US military, or the real work of really any organization, it's about devolving power down and out so that you get fast decision making closest to where the stuff's actually going on. Yeah. And so, um, I was trying to, inside the department, trying to get um, support for uh, mechanisms to do that. And what we landed on is we, we built a course, Nilu talked about it, a training course, with the goal of putting a trained tech officer in every US mission around the world by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and so th that will give us, on a run rate basis, a cadre of people, foreign service officers, who have basic fluency in these topics, who are now leading the tech portfolio in capitals around the world, uh, that's important today. What's important 10 years from now is that those will be our candidates to be US ambassadors in all these countries around the world, and they're not gonna be unfamiliar with these technology issues. They will have spent, they will have been trained, but they also will have spent time doing the work. And that, over time, changes the game. Did you feel that, there's, that there was receptiveness right away in the embassies in the field, or because you, you can imagine, we know this from the private sector, you know, there's a new thing, and like, you know, let this, let this guy over there, you know, do his things with the computers, and we, we know how it's done. You wanna know the real answer? Yes, yeah. I do. So I was trying to get support for this, what felt like a very sensible plan to me, and I was just hitting bureaucratic walls. Mm. So I went to the secretary and I said, are you, you want this, right? Like, this is something that matters to you. This is part of the modernization agenda, and we really need to get this done. He said, yes. So I went on a TV show, and I just announced it and said, the State Department has decided that by the end of next year, we're going to have a basically trained tech officer in every US mission around the world. And all of a sudden, the pieces fell into place to get it done. I'm just like, there's so many things happening right now in my mind. I don't even know. I don't even know how to begin. So it, there, there's a serious lesson here in my view, which is our system, and I, I talk about this with partners around the world all the time. The US system uh, very intentionally has career civil servants and it has political appointees. And when that system is working well, uh, the career, career, I, I think the career civil servants have been denigrated too much mm. uh, in our discourse. There is a role, there's an essential role for real expertise. We need people who know their counterparts, who, who know the politics, know the geography, know how our own system works. We need these cadres, these reservoirs of deep expertise. They, however, are incentivized to get along with each other for the long haul, yeah. which is also important. Yeah. But it doesn't always lend itself to breaking the China in the right ways. Yeah. So we also need people who come in for a relatively short period of time, two years, three years, four years, whatever, who um, have the freedom not to totally freelance and be rogues, but within sort of the guidelines of, uh, of the leadership structure to, to do things that may not otherwise get done. All right, Ambassador, our last question. What was the biggest obstacle? What was the biggest problem 
in this whole rollout and uh, in this this development. Organizationally, you mean from a? Yeah. I think that uh, the 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 biggest single challenge is, right now is actually one of one of distraction. Um, the world is fantastically complex today. Uh, in addition to the, the biggest shooting war on the European continent since 1945, as if that weren't enough, um, this uh, global competition with China is, is multifaceted and, and it extends from every aspect of, of our um, uh, supply chains and sanctions and business competition and these technology infrastructure competition and belt and road issues in every country around the world, including many in our own hemisphere. And then on top of that, since October 7th, you layer in um, a major conflict in the Middle East that, that continuously threatens to become an even more major mm -hmm. conflict in the Middle East that also has created or surfaced an enormous amount of discord and, and dissent and different opinions, strongly held and valid opinions in our own system. Um, it, these, these challenges, so many of these issues in US foreign policy funnel into the same couple dozen people. Yes. Um, and so uh, you, you end up with a, a colossal distraction effect it's v and it's very hard to sustain focus on long-term structural change when the urgency of the moment is so great. A wonderful word on which to end on. Please join me in showing us our appreciation to a wonderful. <laughs> Ambassador, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. All right, um, so Chancellor Deermeyer. I just want to point out that we didn't get to Thucydides <laughs> and the history of the Peloponnesian War and its um, application to the complexities of a unipolar versus multipolar world. We may have to invite Ambassador Fick back to have that conversation. But, but I do want to reflect on some of the really important points that were made today, uh, including about the warm embrace of Article 5. I had never heard it referred to that way. Um, really thinking about Russia. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war is a near miss exercise when it comes to uh, global policy um, and as we reflect on a potential conflict between China and Taiwan. Um, and Ambassador Fick, really want to thank you for highlighting the importance of building uh, and exercising uh, the diplomatic muscle, especially in the technology area and especially as we move and push for trusted technology um, and tech solidarity, as you put it. So um, the quote of the day is, uh, we can all hang together or we will each hang separately. So with that, I would suggest we all go hang <laughs> together uh, for cocktails and, and uh, appetizers out there. So please join me in thanking again the Chancellor and Ambassador. Fick.